Now the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem, in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. At the same time, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shathar Balzani, and their associates came to them and spoke to them thus, Who gave you a decree to build this house and to finish this structure? They also asked them this, What are the names of the men who are building this building? But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them till a report should reach Darius, and then answer be returned by letter concerning it. The copy of the letter which Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shathar Bazanai, and his associates the governors, who were in the province beyond the river, sent to Darius the king, they sent him a report in which was written as follows, To Darius the king, all peace, be it known to the king that we went to the province of Judah, to the house of the great God. It is being built with huge stones, and timber is laid in the walls. This work goes on diligently, and prospers in their lands. Then we asked those elders, and spoke to them thus, Who gave you a decree to build this house, and to finish this structure? We also asked them their names, for your information, that we might write down the names of the men at their head. And this was their reply to us, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the house that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and finished. But because our fathers had angered the God of heaven, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried away the people to Babylonia. However, in the first year of Cyrus king of Babylon, Cyrus the king made a decree that this house of God should be rebuilt, and the gold and silver vessels of the house of God which Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple that was in Jerusalem, and brought into the temple of Babylon. These Cyrus the king took out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered to one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor. And he said to them, Take these vessels, go and put them in the temple which is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be rebuilt on its site. Then this Sheshbazar came and laid the foundations of the house of God which is in Jerusalem. And from that time, until now it has been in building, and it is not yet finished. Therefore, if it seem good to the king, let search be made in the royal archives there in Babylon, to see whether a decree was issued by Cyrus the king for the rebuilding of this house of God in Jerusalem, and let the king send us his pleasure in this matter. Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in Babylonia, in the house of the archives, where the documents were stored, and in Ecbatana, the capital, which is in the province of Media, a scroll was found on which this was written, a record. In the first year of Cyrus the king, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where sacrifices are offered and burnt offerings are brought. Its height shall be 60 cubits and its breadth 60 cubits with three courses of great stones and one course of timber. Let the cost be paid from the royal treasury, and also let the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that is in Jerusalem, and brought to Babylon, be restored, and brought back to the temple which is in Jerusalem, each to its place. You shall put them in the house of God. Now therefore, Tatanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shetharbazanai, and your associates, the governors, who are in the province beyond the river, keep away. Let the work on this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I make a decree regarding what you shall do for these elders of the Jews for the rebuilding of this house of God. The cost is to be paid to these men in full and without delay from the royal revenue, the tribute of the province from beyond the river. And whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, or sheep for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil, as the priests at Jerusalem require, let that be given to them day by day without fail, that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven, and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Also, I make a decree that if anyone alters this edict, a beam shall be pulled out of his house, and he shall be impaled upon it, and his house shall be made a dunghill. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people 
that shall put forth a hand to alter this, or to destroy this house of God, which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, make a decree. Let it be done with all diligence. Then, according to the word sent by Darius the king, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shetharbazanai, and their associates did with all diligence what Darius the king had ordered. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by command of the God of Israel, and by decree of Cyrus and Darius, and Artaxerxes king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And the sons of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the returned exiles, celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They offered at the dedication of this house of God one hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, twelve he-goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions, and the Levites in their courses, for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. On the fourteenth day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover, for the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were clean. So they killed the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, for their fellow priests, and for themselves. It was eaten by the sons of Israel who had returned from exile, and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the pollutions of the peoples of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful, and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them, so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise dispenses knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he who heeds admonition is prudent. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but trouble befalls the income of the wicked. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the minds of fools. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who pursues righteousness. There is severe discipline for him who forsakes the way. He who hates reproof will die. Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of men! A scoffer does not like to be reproved, he will not go to the wise. A glad heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is broken. The mind of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouths of fools feed on folly. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted ox and hatred with it. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. The way of a sluggard is overgrown with thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is a joy to him who has no sense, but a man of understanding walks aright. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples and, having exhorted them, took leave of them and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through these parts and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he determined to return through Macedonia. So Peter of Beroea, the son of Phyrus, accompanied him. End of the Thessalonians Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius, and Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus, and Trophimus. These went on and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lights in the upper chamber where we gathered, and a young man named Eutychus was sitting in the window. He sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer, and being overcome by sleep, 
he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and embracing him said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while, until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the lad away alive, and were not a little comforted. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day we touched at Samos. And the day after that we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, so that he might not have to spend time in Asia. For he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Faith takes courage. The sad exiles, who had finally returned to Jerusalem, and then had their temple-building project stopped by the authorities, must have been discouraged. The project had been halted for about ten years, but the Lord stirs his people into action through the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah. The Jews finally begin to work again on the temple, and yet are opposed by a local governor. With great bravery, they respond, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. We could use that sort of courage and faith whenever we take a risk for the Lord. Every time we confront temptation, we should keep these words in mind. Like Haggai and Zechariah, St. Paul encourages the believers with his preaching. Yet he speaks so long and so late into the night that one of his listeners falls out of a window to his death. Even so, Paul undauntedly prays for the man and keeps on preaching till daybreak, when the dead man rises to life. Whether we think of Paul's bold faith to pray for a resurrection or the Jews' bravery in rebuilding the temple, we should call these examples to mind when our faith needs encouragement. Is your faith timid or courageous?